Good afternoon. So attentive. I think we're waiting for a few more folks to join us from the waiting room. If you are joining us um, on Zoom today, uh, welcome uh, to this Tools for the Creative Life uh, workshop series. It is the month of March. Um, and uh, we do these workshops every month. Um, it is a partnership between some wonderful organizations and um, we will give each of those organizations a chance to introduce themselves, but just make sure you know you are in the right place. Uh, today is uh, the March Tools for the Creative Life workshop. Um, and we're talking about sort of ageism in arts, hearing from some of our art elders in our arts community of what they've seen and what they're experiencing uh, still today as leaders in our community. Um, before we dive into that, um, I'd love to take a quick moment um, and do a brief uh, land acknowledgement. Um, so before we kick things off, um, I would like to acknowledge the land I'm that we all- i uh, talking. If someone, thank you if you wanna mute yourself, thank you. Um, the, to acknowledge the land we live, work and create on um, is the traditional territory of the Ute, Cheyenne and Arapaho peoples. We intentionally recognize the 48 contemporary tribal nations that are historically tied to the lands that make up Colorado. We honor our elders, past, present, and future, and all of those who have stewarded this land throughout generations. We recognize that government, academic, and cultural institutions were founded upon and continue to enact exclusions and erasures of indigenous peoples. We also recognize that much of our nation was built by the hands and on, and on the backs of enslaved Africans and indigenous peoples. We stand in awe of their resilience and creativity and we express gratitude for and celebrate their past and ongoing con contributions. We strive to never take for granted the privilege and complexity of living, working and creating on this land and intentionally honor uh, black indigenous and communities of color in our city and our state we commit to cultural equity and strive to make this a safe and welcoming space where healing can occur, truths can be told, hidden stories unearthed, and legacies of oppression and inequity continuously dismantled. In addition, uh, we are dedicated to presenting this event, this workshop today, uh, in an inclusive fashion. Um, so if you are able, um, we invite you to update your name on your Zoom. You can click and and rename yourself um, and include your pronouns if you desire. Um, again, it's helping to sort of normalize that practice. Thank you all for that. Um, I realize I didn't introduce myself. I'm Meredith Badler. I'm the deputy director of the CBCA, the Colorado Business Committee for the Arts. We are one of several organizations that partners to put on this Tools for the Creative Life workshop series. Um, I'll throw some links in the chat about us at CBCA. Our mission is all about advancing the creative economy through that intersection of arts and business. And we are honored to be part of this partnership. I'm going to uh, toss it to, I believe, either John or Leah from Transforming Creatives uh, to introduce uh, their organization. Hello, everyone. I'm John, as Meredith said. Uh, Executive Director of Transforming Creatives, we invest in the health of creatives so they can invest in the health of society. And part of our work uh, includes operating a workspace in the Rhino Art District called Converge Denver that is home to uh, filmmakers, photographers, writers, visual artists, designers, nonprofits, and uh, other super creative humans. We also provide uh, micro grants to artists through our Artists of Color Fund moving resources into communities of color, uh, one artist at a time. And we recently launched a new program called Creative Assembly. And Creative Assembly brings together, brings artists together for, for shared learning, for, for mutual support, and, and for experiences in community. And our next gathering is next week, uh, the 23rd at 5.30, actually in person this time at Converge. And uh, we're gonna be joined by artists and collaborators uh, from Interplay Art and Opera, 
which is uh, an interdisciplinary performance and gallery project or gallery project that kind of bridges the gap between contemporary visual art and, and live opera. And so we will discuss the artistic process and collaboration and, and kind of how music and art can inform each other. And uh, we will drop uh, a link into the chat uh, for, for that. So you can join us potentially. And I think I'm throwing this to Ali unless Teague is here, but I don't see them. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Ali Sharp. I am with the Rhino Art District in Denver and we are thrilled to be a partner on this series. Um, we have a great panel lined up for you today. So I think without further ado, I will hand it over to our moderators today. Um, we have Ari Shapiro here. Ari is the founder of Silver Cat Design Art Consultation and Interior Decor in Denver, um, which specializes in art placement for senior living and hospitality environments. Um, and we also have joining us today, Alexandria or Alex Pangburn. She is the director of curation for the Rhino Art District. She is also the founder of Babe Walls, and an established artist here in the Denver area. Um, she runs the Rhino Mural Program and also helps facilitate, organize, and manage artistic opportunities within the district and Denver as a whole. So with that, I will hand it all over to you to get us started. Hi, um, really great to see you all. And um, thank you so much for joining us today. We're really honored to have four, um, really talented artists that have been in the Denver community for a long time. And I'm really excited to talk to each and every one of them um, along with Ari. We've kind of put some questions together for them to talk about just um, age in the arts and how you know that affects the work and evolution of an artist's um, artist's medium. So um, we want to introduce, introduce Arlette Lucero, we have Yoshi Saito, and then we have Sharon Brown and Emmanuel Martinez. Um, so thank you all so much for joining today. And um, yeah, I guess I just kind of wanted to start off um, with allowing those artists to have a chance to kind of introduce themselves and um, the mediums that they work in and how long they have been a part of the Denver community. So um, I don't know if somebody wants to start off or if you want me to call on you. <laughs> Let's see. Arlette, you want to go? Oh, you unmuted me. Okay, so my name is Arlette Lucero and I have been in the art scene, geez, I'd like to say um, 40 years, but maybe it's been yeah, about that, about that long. And I work with, um, I paint and I do illustration um, and I do some other things that are um, art related. Like uh, right now, um, I, I'm, I was a teacher artist, um, but I'm also the educator at chalkgallery.org. So um, I put together classes, but um, yeah. So the medium I like to paint with mostly is um, acrylic. I used to be oil um, and, uh, and watercolor for my illustrations. Great. Just go down the line. Sharon, you want to go next? Uh, well, I'm Sharon Brown and uh, I have, my midlife crisis was to turn to art full time. And so for the last 35 years, I've been an artist here. And for 30 years, I, we, my husband Rex and I um, rehabbed an old factory uh, that was an old industrial pattern shop and turned it into the pattern shop studio where for the last 30 years, we've had shows of various artists, uh, many shows and uh, I'm pretty prolific. In the last 35 years, I've, I've inspired by this talk, I counted up how many paintings I've made and it's 836. <laughs> this is part of the problem with being old. You got a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, we were one of the founding families of Rhino with Tracy and Jill, and uh, we, we have been um, thrilled to be here, thrilled to be here. Great. 
Emmanuel, you want to go next? Oh, might be on mute, maybe. Can't hear you. Did someone hmm. call him? Um, let's see. I can't go. OK, Yoshi, you want to go? We'll figure, figure okay. it out with the manual. I'm Yoshi Saito. Um, I'm a contemporary bronze sculptor, having a small private studio foundry in Rhino. And my approach is uh, uh, that of an obsessive craftsman, perhaps because I have a period of doing serious crafting glass blowing before. So I have to do everything from the beginning to the end with my hands in order to realize my work. Um, and you may think that's, that doesn't sound unique, but it is in bronze because most of the artists uh, use commercial foundry to uh, create bronze pieces uh, and, uh, while I was, I'm doing it by myself. And um, I also have uh, used bronze as an art conceptual means. Uh, I will explain to you how so. Uh, later in this talk. Thank you. I have Emmanuel on speaker on my phone. So Emmanuel, I don't know if you want to try and talk and see if we can hear you through my end. Okay, could you, could you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm uh, Emmanuel Martinez. I'm uh, a Denver native. And I've been doing uh, artwork since I was 13 when I did my first bureau in gold in Colorado at, the, at a facility there for incarcerated kids. And I, I consider the pioneer of the mural movement here in Colorado, uh, having done first murals, public murals in 1968, uh, which is, I don't know how many years that, that is ago, but. It's over 50 anyway, but, uh, and I've done, uh, it's, it, uh, at least a hundred, hundred murals now throughout in about 17 states and in, in three other countries. Uh, and I, I'm also a sculptor. Uh, I've done numerous public works of art all, uh, throughout the United States and several states, including here in Colorado, uh, I got uh, at, at least uh, half, I, I, did, I don't know, I have four pieces at State Capitol and, and, and other pieces in, in other parts. And, uh, and I, uh, I, I'm also a painter. I, I paint, I paint uh, easel paintings and, and I've shown a lot in, in uh, you know, in, in nature exhibits over the years. And, uh, and I, I reside in Morrison now, been here about 44 years, and uh, but I'm still pretty active in the in the art uh, the community, I guess, in Colorado. So <laughs> that's that's my past. Uh. Cool, great. Okay. Um, thank you all for sharing that. And so our first talk topic that we want to talk about is um, kind of like each of your all's journeys into becoming a full time artist and, you know, what that was like when you started versus what that is to you now at this point. Should I start? <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, I uh, was wanting to be an artist uh, gee, for a long time. And so um, I almost didn't take that in college. My mother wanted me to take something else, take Spanish, take business. And I said, well, I'm gonna take some art classes. And they kind of talked me into going full blast into that. And so when I got out of college, I was pretty determined to become an artist. And um, when I met my husband, Stevan Lucero, he was a full-time artist and it was me, him, and maybe three other artists. We had a studio together and we called it Meta Studio. But um, through Meta Studio, we also, well, 
actually this kind of happened a little bit before they had organization called Chalk Gallery, Chicago Humanities and Arts Council. And so Meta Studio, um, Chalk Gallery, um, that was kind of the start of becoming a full-time artist for me. Um, and that was pretty much a, a blast and um, really, really, really enjoyed doing that. You know, all of us painting in one place and then showing our art together. And um, I also went into commercial art at that time. So I took some classes in, um, but that didn't stick as much with me. Although I do know um, Photoshop, Illustrator and all of that. Um, so that came in handy later. Um, and then later I went into uh, um, illustrating books and so on and so forth. So that's how I started. Well, I think I told you um, that uh, I, I sort of uh, came full-time to art after sort of a midlife crisis. In fact, after my husband and I saw Rocky, and I said, <laughs> oh, wow, wouldn't it be great to do something I actually love to do? Like the Sylvester Stallone movie? Being, <laughs> being in sociology, the, the thankless profession of social services you know where you know one of those hopeless human condition kind of professions and um when i decided to take a canvas and slap some paint on there uh i played with it worked from an old photograph of my two sisters-in-law and um I had an acrylic underpainting and oil wash on top. And as soon as I finished it, I said, this is what I want to do the rest of my life. And uh, luckily, that is kind of how it turned out. Uh, fortunately, I had a very supportive husband who supported my life and my work. And uh, therefore, this, this entire enterprise of the Pattern Shop Studio uh, really was, was a leap, especially 30 years ago. I'll tell you more about that later. But um, yeah, it, 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 uh, it was an easy decision because it felt like I was coming home. Coming home to my childhood, which was spent drawing, working out all my issues by drawing uh, situations, et cetera. Uh, always about people also. So I've always been a figurative artist. Oh, people have always been at the center of my interests because my father and brother and grandfather were all psychiatrists. And so the psychological and the interactions between people always was a real focus for me. Great. Yoshi? Well, I finished my uh, graduate degree in 1987 and um, started showing my work in San Francisco right away. So I've been a professional artist for uh, 35 years. Um, when I came to Denver 16 years ago, means uh, uh, nearly half of my career is spent here in Colorado. Uh, and I see many excellent pieces uh, were produced here. But that's uh, resulted from me becoming a full-time artist for the first time in my life. Um, uh, before I came here, I, I had had uh, a full-time job such as teaching. Uh, that obviously brought some constant uh, disruptions in my art making activity. So that's that's my story here. Yeah. Emmanuel? Uh, well, like I said earlier, I, uh, I, 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 I did my first mural and that's really where I started doing artwork. Uh, when I was a uh, uh, juvenile delinquent uh, serving time at the uh, facility in Golden, Colorado. Uh, that's where I uh, recognized my talent as an artist. And, uh, and I was helped uh, by, uh, uh, by a, a, an artist from Santa Fe by the name of Bill Longley, who uh, was my mentor and who kind of uh, was implementing uh, an arts program for high risk youth, and I, uh, I became his uh, apprentice, and, and stayed with him for two years. Uh, he was a painter, sculptor, 
and a muralist and uh and he uh pretty much taught me quite a bit and got me back into the public school system in denver uh and uh, from there on i i just uh got involved in the civil rights movement in 1966 uh, I, as an incorporator of the Crusade for Justice with Courtney Gonzalez. And I, that same year, I worked with Cesar Chavez. Uh, and, uh, and I also worked uh, with uh, the Martin Luther King's organization in 1968. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I was an activist, and I still am. I, consider myself when it comes to civil rights and justice. Uh, so, uh, so my artwork pretty much related, uh, for seven years, I did just artwork for the Chicano movement and some for the black movement. Uh, and then following that, I just, um, I started painting murals in the Denver area. Uh, like I said, in 68 and in 1971, I did, um, uh, was a very pretty prolific year in Denver for my murals. Uh, I did them in several parks in Denver, uh, including Curtis Park and West Diesel Park. Uh, a lot of, I helped out at La Raza Park. I did one in Alma Park, Argo Park, Robert F. Kennedy Center. So, so I painted quite a few murals on that year uh, in the early 70s. And uh, so that and it, later on, uh, I got into sculpture uh, in, in the late seventies, uh, and I, I I I taught at the Art Students League of Denver for twelve years, uh, teaching figurative sculpture and and draw and drawing, uh, and I'm self-taught. I don't have any formal education, uh, or you know the only. I, I was an apprentice to Bill Longley for two years uh, when I was a kid, and I also worked had workshops with uh, with uh, uh, Francisco Suniga of Mexico, who was the most prominent sculptor in Latin America for a while, and I also worked with David Alfaro Cicados, who was the most significant muralist in the world. When I was 19 years old, I went to Mexico and worked with him uh, on on the a mural, which is the largest mural in the world in, uh, in Mexico City. Uh, so I, I, you know, I have my background has essentially been with uh, just working with as as an apprentice or workshops with uh, with other artists. So I, I don't, uh, you know, have uh, any formal education. In it, but, but I've I've managed to to uh, do art artwork since then. I haven't had a real job since 1971 when I was working for Parks and Recreation as a full time as a full time muralist. Uh, I, at first, I was at Lalma Recreation Center as first director, and then I became a, a full time muralist uh, for the city of Denver. Probably the last muralist for the city of Denver. I don't, I, I don't think I, I know of anyone who ever worked full time for them. Uh, but I was also fired by them because I didn't want to, I, they wanted me to paint over another artist painting a mural, uh, Roberto Lucero mural, who I helped, uh, get together and got him the materials, and, uh, at, at La Raza Park and I refused to do it. So I got fired. So then I moved on to New Mexico and lived there for a few years. But uh, so I, I essentially uh, just do mainly public works of art and I show in, in museums. Uh, I have a permanent collection of works uh, in, in the Smithsonian, Washington, D.C. And uh, I'm going to show now at the Denver Art Museum and the Boulder Museum. Uh, and, and the uh, museum in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, I didn't think I, I forgot the name. Amen. It is. It's a. It's a, a exhibition on on the the, the revolution, uh, the graphic arts, and the Chicago movement. Uh, so I, you know, I managed to stay involved. Uh, I 
I was one of the founders of the Museo de las Americas. Uh, my brother-in-law and I started that, which was uh, essentially the, the first art venue that was on Santa Fe, an uh, art district. That was 30, 30 years ago. Uh, and I've, been, I've stayed an uh, arts advocate ever since, uh, been a numerous uh, organizations, including Chuck, like Arlette, known I, Arlette and her husband, um, Stevan for many years. And, uh, and we've, we've been just art ad advocates ever since. I think our, Arlette is, uh, it, you know, has, has been a very good art, arts advocate and I, I respect her for that. But anyway, but as far as the Rhino district is concerned, I'm, I, you know, I, we could get into that later, I guess, but I'm, uh, I've never been involved with the Rhino Heart District. I've never been invited to do anything there. Uh, even though I was, uh, the first muralist in this Rhino District to do a mural and at, at Curtis Park in 1971, which is still there by the way. And, uh, we also have an arts organization to preserve Chicano murals, which are being destroyed by gentrification, uh, and you know, and, and and just other other things. But I don't I don't want to get into all that right now. But unless you want you want to talk about that, that might be able might be an opportunity to talk about that. You know, throughout our conversation, um, it's really interesting to talk to all four of you because you have such different medium backgrounds, and I'm sure that you know, doing that medium throughout the time that you all have been artists has evolved and changed drastically. Um, so I guess I kind of wanted to start with Yoshi. Um, you do a lot of bronze work and I kind of wanted to talk to you about the evolution of, you know, when you first started doing bronze work versus, you know, now, what is that biggest evolution that you see in, in your work? Well, it's a long story actually, but, uh, 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 the, let me see, um, I was in the Bay Area for schooling, and, but let me start from this much earlier uh, thing. I was born in Tokyo, Japan, and uh, my father was, uh, uh, was uh, a professor in theology. And um, um, so he had this uh, 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 d d demeanor of think thinking all the time. And, and naturally it made him really kind of serious. Right, and plus he had this uh, trauma from uh, World War uh, Two, and uh, uh, he had to to live with, uh, such as like he lost his brother, and uh, uh, after a Russian soldier uh, took him away uh, uh, from uh, uh, somewhere he was, uh, uh, you know, in China or something, and never came back, and so it, it, that was a trauma for my father, and also he didn't like the the way Japanese society. Uh, all, all of a sudden started to change the application. And, and so he, he had all these uh, uh, mega issues always with him and uh, always kind of serious. Uh, but uh, 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 as a kid observing my father, I noticed that the moment he became very happy uh, 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 and that was uh, his gardening. And when he does uh, uh, work in the garden or raising, you know, uh, vegetable in, in a small vegetable pot, something, he looked very happy. And then seeing that, I did, I, I, I kind of figured, okay, I'm gonna do something uh, with my hands and that to produce something, and that probably uh, uh, bring me happiness. And uh, that my that instinct was uh, was uh, was right one that I'm, I'm proving it and. Uh, uh, but there's a long way to, you know, uh, many things happened in between then and now. And, um, um, uh, but I was, uh, uh, during, the, during the period I was in the uh, graduate school, I was in the Bay Area and it was mid, uh, early to uh, mid eighties. And the world was still an analog period. I don't know if you remember, or maybe you don't even remember, <laughs> but uh, uh, maybe you're not born yet. <laughs> But it, it in a, uh, but it, the you know the Bay Area has Silicon Valley, a mysterious place that I looked for. I, I tried to identify where the Silicon Valley is with this paper map, and I, it didn't tell me where. But and so I ended up with it, I figured it was a nick nickname uh, for this computer 
uh, research and development uh, 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 the place. And they use silicon, that's why it's Silicon Valley. But anyway, um, the, there was a lot of sort of fancy speculative uh, talk about upcoming digital age. And it sounded really good. You know, it's like one, they was talking about once we have this, this, this can be possible, this and this and this, and uh, without ha we having any gadget, no, no personal computers yet, no internet, no way. Um, um, and uh, uh, so there was always, always kind of fancy talk. And I was young, you know, I'm, uh, in my 20s, and so I was uh, uh, paying attention to, to those something new because that's nature of young people, right? And um, because you you want to be uh, relevant to the you know uh, in, in the social cultural context. Anyway, so I was fascinated. At the same time, uh, I, I I had this kind of sense of doubt and and also fear, even fear uh, about this upcoming something. And because I was studying sculpture, sculpture is something that you know it's tactile analog, and you you make. Uh, and you also, uh, uh, you make things in, with your hands and body, but also you experience sculpture with your body. And it, it's, it's really, you know, uh, th that's very, very nature of uh, 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 sculpture thing. So I was, I was just like, man, maybe what I, uh, uh, I, I'm doing, what I'm learning, I'm, I'm doing, I'm trying to do, uh, would become irrelevant. In, in, in the future, upcoming ages. Uh, and uh, so I had a sense of fear. And in that kind of psychological context, I, I, this, I started to think about what to do. Uh, so uh, I was brainstorming all the time uh, uh, and uh, came to a conclusion that the, um, um, I'm gonna use this uh, uh, ancient technology and it totally is on a kind of, drastic, but totally going against this, you know, the high-tech new technology movement. And uh, 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 okay, I'm gonna use this bronze, which was uh, discovered and developed in uh, 5,500 years ago uh, as, uh, as uh, the highest technology that human history uh, was able to uh, uh, bring uh, to. And, uh, uh, and with certain sort of instinctive guess, Probably not, not many very talented upcoming avant-garde artists would going to use it. And uh, so I have, I have less competition <laughs> in, in, in the obvious you know, reality that there's so many competitions you know, to, to, you know, uh, with, uh, with colleagues and with uh, upcoming uh, artists. And, and so that's how I started to use bronze, believe it or not. And, uh, but I kept this in, uh, 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 in myself because m people around me started to tell me, don't do it. Just don't use bronze because you're gonna be seen as backward and irrelevant in, in, the, in the contemporary art discourse. So they, they warned me, just Yoshi, don't, just stay away, don't do it. But uh, uh, I, I, as, as I said, I have some kind of instinct and uh, I waited until uh, I became a little more confident uh, uh, confident with what I uh, what I exhibit in public, so that's how I uh, personally sort of uh, developed my uh, course of uh, art in in sculpture. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Are right, you wanna you wanna shoot the next questions out? Sure. Yeah, and that that is an awesome segue and such an interesting perspective. Saying like you were almost doing it in reverse that bronze was an ancient you know technology but it was cutting edge at the time and so i think that's really interesting it's a great segue into our next inquiry for all of you or anybody um we we would love to hear a little bit about how you may or may not you know utilize modern technology in the place of um either creating your art or the process um, is there a dichotomy between, you know, how college art students today would do it using iPads or 3D printing or like using technology to plan, create their art versus sort of like a traditionalist aspect, you know, pencil and paper. Um, and we have a couple painters on the panel. I went to art school for painting personally and a huge discussion at the time 
um, was, is digital painting painting? Is it the process of painting? Is it, you know, to be a painter, does that mean you have to use physical oil paints and brushes or, you know, there, I think it was a huge hot topic at the time. So um, yeah, any of anything about how, you know, if, if you are all traditionalists or if you choose to use modern technology um, in your process, I would love to hear a little bit about that. I'm totally a traditionalist. Um, maybe I'm just too old. I, I, I don't know. I, my husband fusses around with uh, digital and I, I sort of uh, dis, uh, I kind of disregard it like it's sort of cheating or something. Uh, I, I don't know how to describe it. It's just that I don't think I have the intellectual and technological wherewithal to venture into these into these avenues that I think are uh, very current and relevant and hot and all that kind of stuff. I just I just don't know how much I could contribute to that conversation just because I'm I'm happily stuck in being an oil painter and a watercolorist. You know, I'm just stuck doing those things with brushes. I would I would like to say something about that. Um, uh, as an illustrator, um, I've been doing a lot of tummy tale books, and with that, um, it's different uh, authors, um, and they're telling their story. In, and it's um, and it involves food sometimes because it's also a recipe book. So um, as I'm doing reading, reading these stories, there's a lot of things that I don't understand what they are. And then I'm trying to picture, you know, how I'm going to illustrate the story. So I do use the computer a lot to um, look up items. Let's say it's a Jewish story and they're using all of these words um, and descriptions of it. And I don't know what the food looks like. I don't know, you know, how the person would dress, you know, or let's say Scandinavian and they're referring to something. <clears throat> so I do download a lot of images per each illustration so that I can illustrate the story um, the way that I'm kind of picturing it in my head, but with more detail. Now, as for um, doing my, my work, Digitally, I have tried that. <laughs> I, I have tried to do that. And I did do that for a little bit, but it is so much easier to do um, a painting. You know, you get a photograph of somebody and you can use that photograph or you can, um, yeah, so it's easier for me not to do a painting digitally, but to just actually work with the medium um, than to try to do it that way. And I've seen beautiful, beautiful art that's been done digitally. And I, I say, go for it, do it any way you can. My son does that. He works in digital art, beautiful stuff. So, yep, <laughs> I go traditional. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm like this is Brown here. I, I'm a very old school child. <laughs> traditionalist I guess you might say because uh, I, I I'm still a little uh, still a little ignorant I think when it comes to computers uh, I you know I, I, I know the basics and uh, you know in, in this business you you have to you know you just have to to, to get involved with that and I have been uh, uh, to, a, to a very limited degree you know I don't <laughs> I never studied or taken a class in computer technology or especially in, in, in the arts uh, you know I <laughs> I, re I respect and I appreciate the, some of the new technology uh, that I've learned about uh, like you know I, I've done a lot of sculpture uh, also and <laughs> you know they have ways of blowing up uh scaling up sculpture now that uh when i started doing it in around 1980 the first largest piece i did <clears throat> you know i uh had to back in the day just basically use the grid the old grid system which i still use in my murals and all that uh, so i don't uh 
Uh, I, you know, I have nothing against uh, the technology and uh, that I like our that I've seen a lot of great, uh, you know, uh, digital images and uh, and you know, it, and it does require skill. It, uh, at, at first, I I thought it was kind of like cheating, uh, but I you know kind of realized that. Uh, you know that it, it you know there it, it does take some because uh, i watched my grandson do it and and you know he's he's, he's really good at it and then i gave it a try and then you know it's I, I i just can't do it you know it's one of those things like a video game or something i'm no good at all that kind of stuff so you know i appreciate it and and uh but i i have i'm i'm too old to pursue any uh any new type of uh uh, methods and, and the new technology. So I'll stick to the old, you know, brush and paint and, uh, and you know, clay. And I, uh, you know, no, I, I, but like I said, I, I do respect uh, some of the artists I, that the work that I have seen. I, I you know, I, but I, I have no interest in pursuing anything like that. Thank you. I think that's so that's so cool that you still do murals from a grid system um you must be the only one really with not using projectors i think that's really commendable um and just hard <laughs> they tried to teach us grid system in school and it's like a headache for me but i'm not very mathematical so <laughs> well um, i have used a projector when i did my murals because it makes okay. it so much easier and so much yeah. faster <laughs> Yeah, I think that's such uh, an interesting they, conversation. You know, they, most of my murals are a lot of our exterior big, pretty large murals. Uh, my mm -hmm. largest mural is 10,000 square feet downtown mm -hmm. Denver. And you can't use a projector. No way. A project. Uh, in mm -hmm. most of those uh, exterior murals, uh, I could see if you're making a, a larger painting inside uh, where, where you could have some kind of projector. But uh, but in my case, you, you, the grid system is, uh, I think, the only way to, to do them. I mean, I, I, I can't think of a better, easier way to, to do it than the grid system. Unless you could set up the, you know, the projectors, I guess you'd have to do it at night or something on the, on the outside wall. But I've never done anything like that. Well, grid seems to be working for your beautiful murals. Um, I think that's actually an awesome segue into um, my next question. And, um, you know, a 10,000 square foot mural, I and specifically for you, Emmanuel and Yoshi. Um, I'd love to hear about, you know, aging bodies in the arts and you both specifically undergo like very laborious conditions to create your art enormous murals, bronze pouring is dangerous and a lot of work, a lot of physical work. And, you know, how, what, what are the differences that you all see in when you started making art decades ago, as far as the physical act of, of creating your art versus now and, um, you know, the physical demand of art making. Oh, Yoshi, you're muted. Kimmy? Yes. Okay. Oh, uh, let me uh, uh, add, uh, uh, because I, I wasn't not able to uh, comment on that previous question. Uh, and, and so I just go through, I mean, short. But Ali, I have no interest uh, putting myself into the framework of uh, traditionalist or non traditionalist. And that's, that's not my interest at all. I'm interested in, in, in the uh, idea of producing gen, some, what genuine, genuine. What, what is real uh, to me? And uh, so the, the methodology, the method I use or what other people use, that, that's, not, it, that's, that's not my business and that's not, you know, that's, that doesn't come to the, to the uh, uh, match of the, uh, the, the final result. And um, uh, you, you, you know, we, we, we talk about body, mind and spirit for life, you know, the balance of it. I apply that uh, uh, to art as well. And uh, body, it means some, and material, 
or it, it, it can be digital, whatever. And a mind is something that we, we uh, think about, you know, this art, the concept. And, and spirit is, is something that uh, uh, it, it excites uh, uh, everything, ignites everything and inspire everything. And those three things are, uh, has to be in, 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 in each artwork uh, to, be, to be real, to be genuine, to be variable in any society, in any time. And so that's my interest. So this, the, uh, uh, to me, that's this idea of traditionalist, whatever this, I, I don't think that's very uh, a useful uh, uh, approach to, to think about what is art. Anyway, um, to, to your question, the physical thing, yes, naturally. Of course, uh, 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 the, uh, the, I, as I age, I, I notice I, I'm becoming weaker. But, but I also noticed that uh, the fact that I, when I was young, I had to go uh, uh, through many tests and experimentations to reach to some agreeable conclusions. And, and, uh, but now I became far more economical, not to waste time and materials in order to get what I want. Uh, that, uh, that compensates the decline of my physical strength. Do you see my point? Yes, absolutely. I, uh, I have, for the last seven years, paid the consequence of having a scoliotic back. And I was always a standing painter. Uh, and I love it. Now I can't stand. So I, I have to sit, I have this chair and everything. It's the biggest pain in the neck <laughs> not to be able to just stand and paint. Uh, now I've got this chair that keeps rotating around and, you know, I can't, I got to find some place to anchor myself. I mean, it's just, you know, aging is, <laughs> it ain't for sissies, as uh, Betty Davis said. Um, yeah, so I it definitely affects affects the process um it, it, everything becomes more laborious you know or a little more irritating to to accomplish and you have to put so much more effort than you used to you know i used to be able to do anything walk anywhere run now i can't even take a walk and um so i mean these are the accommodations you have to make but on the other hand the price is too enormous not to do art. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, my motto was always art saves lives. It, it certainly changed mine and saved it. We always carry some um, um, the issues uh, or some sense of frustration. When I was young, I was yeah. frustrated with uh, being ignored <laughs> and, and uh, uh, now be, become a part of the, you know, uh, 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 major uh, uh, scene, whatever, and and now and now I have a frustration with physical issue, but yeah. less with yeah. uh, with this acceptance uh, in artwork, and those issues start to be less of the value, and uh, uh, somehow uh, in in these days, like if you ignore me, <laughs> that's fine, and and uh, so there's always change. Uh, you know, in terms of frustration, this <laughs> transformation, <laughs> something is happening for sure. Being an artist is frustrating in all capacities. I refuse to <laughs> age. <laughs> it's okay. People think you are, you're, kind of nuts. you're doing real well. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us more about that age refusal. I love it. Oh, uh, well, um, yeah, I watched my husband slowly deteriorate and it was very sad because he didn't want to take care of himself. And he's brilliant. He's a wonderful artist, but he didn't want to eat right. He didn't want to exercise. And so he died of a heart attack again. I mean, he he already went through like what? Two, three heart attacks and the last one killed him. So after that, and kind of before that, you know, I'm eating correctly. I go up and down the stairs, I'm up to 20, you know, now. So I'm just gonna keep working on that. And I don't wanna, I don't wanna go the way he did, at least not anytime soon. So um, that's where I'm at with my physical body. And I seem to have more energy than ever. So that's good. <laughs> and that's all I wanna say about that subject. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm, uh, 
Uh, I'm, I'm still very active, and I've been very fortunate uh, health-wise. I, I don't have any health issues. I'm 74 years old, uh, and I've done been through, done a lot of work over the years. And thank goodness, I, I uh, most of my murals uh, are community murals, and uh, in, in, which means essentially that I. I design the mural and uh, mix the colors, and I have unskilled volunteer people that help me. And sometimes I'll hire uh, an artist assistant. So the, the bulk of the work that I have managed to get done in murals uh, have been with with the help of a lot of, of young, young people. Young people, a lot of energy. Uh, but you know, it, it, I, I I still get on scaffolds uh, if I have to. I you know, I mean, they, you know, I do a lot more on the uh, powered ones. But uh, back in the day, we did just you know regular scaffolds. But uh, but I, I I've been very fortunate uh, health wise, and uh, oh. uh, I continue to, I, I continue to work. Uh, and, if, you know doing paintings, uh, mural commissions. And my, as far as my bronze sculptures are concerned, I, I you know, I, I, all I, I do the original clay works and I have, uh, I do the mold and the wax work. And then I take it to a foundry because I, I let them do all that work because I'm not interested in doing that. I, you know, I've learned in the foundries how to do metal chasing and uh, some welding but I'm not I'm just not into that uh, anymore I, you know it's like uh, it just involves too much work uh, physical work and uh, so I essentially on some of my large scale sculptures uh, especially the more contemporary ones are made out of steel uh, uh, and, you know, I don't even do those. I, I just have them done. I, I'll do the maquette, the small scale piece, uh, but, you know, they're usually around 18 or 20 inches high. And then I'll, if I get the commission, commission, <clears throat> I'll have an engineer, I'll have an engineer figure out how to make it 35 feet high. That's the largest one I've done in Denver. Uh, so I don't do all that work. I just do the, I do the small scale thing and then let somebody else do all the work. Of course, they make all the money too, most of the money because they did fabrication, but I'm just not, uh, I, you know, when it comes to steel, uh, you know, especially some of these piece, big pieces are half inch steel, half inch thick steel that I, you know, I, I just don't mess with any of that stuff. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be glad to do a, a small maquette, but that's as far as I go with that. But as yeah. far as the murals are concerned, I still, I still do the, the grid system. Uh, I, you know, and, and and I don't have to hire engineers to, to help me with that. I do my own little engineering on that, but. I, I think you know I, that's true of a lot of contemporary artists. I don't think I don't think they do most of the work on their piece. They usually have to commit, have to have somebody fabricate it for them. Uh, so, but you know, I'm, I'm I have no intentions of retiring, uh, and I'm just just going to keep working away and, until I can't do it anymore. That's all I all I can say. If I cannot uh, uh, do my work physically by myself, I would stop. And uh, uh, that's probably the timing uh, uh, for me to go on to a different uh, uh, period uh, or phase of my life. But anyway, do you remember the, uh, the Matisse uh, was laying down on the bed uh, when he was, uh, uh, was sick or whatever, and he was using this long stick and, to, uh, and, and doing drawing on the, uh, on the wall or paper, whatever. Do you remember that picture? Mm -hmm. I thought that was very yeah. inspiring. You remember that? I thought that was very yeah. inspi inspiring because uh, uh, the, uh, that, the long stick with the pencil or uh, whatever uh, attached to it uh, was, uh, was a huge challenge, I bet, for Matisse. And I, I remember seeing all these uh, uh, instructors at art colleges or, or schools. Uh, they ask students to use 
this long stick to, to draw, draw something. The, and that's a difficult challenge because it's very different from, you know, just approaching to the uh, 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 a paper or a canvas with this, with your hand and immediately you can move, you know, and, but stick, it's, uh, it's very difficult. And yeah, so well, the, I, should, the, the I, I, I thought that, that was very interesting funny. image. I know, no, I was just gonna point out that, uh, I don't know if I invented this or not, but uh, since I've been doing large scale murals, I, I uh, you know, I, I, I like to go fishing and one day my, my fishing, uh, my fishing pole broke and I was about to throw it away. And I, and it, it you know, it's, there's about five foot of it left. And, uh, and the little hole that where it broke, uh, is about the same size as a piece of charcoal. And, uh, I, I just stick charcoal. I still working with that fishing pole, uh, more than 30 years now. And, uh, and I, I, I don't, I definitely don't get up to the wall and draw a cut on the wall. I, I, I always, I'm standing at four or five feet away when I'm, uh, when I'm drawing a mural, uh, you know, so I, I, I see where, you know, like Matisse, I, I, I I've seen that, that picture and he did actually quite a bit, uh, in his older age of some large scale work, but. But like I said, you know, even with in the, the case of Matisse or Picasso, any of them guys, uh, they would do some smaller works, but they always had, uh, for large scale works, they had somebody, I think, fabricate them or do most of the work, you know, because they, you just can't physically do that. But I mean, everybody thinks Michelangelo did everything himself, and that's not true. They had apprentices that did a lot of the work for him. Mm -hmm. You know what? Uh, it's a little bit off the subject, but uh, I remember when I was younger in the Bay Area, there was a tremendous interest in 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 uh, intellectual exchange. You know, the talking about art uh, with other uh, uh, artists, young artists, and um, uh, it, it, to, in order to stimulate your brain, artistic sort of creative brain, and um, uh, but less interest in collaborations, and because. Everyone was uh, was really sort of interested in individualism. You know, leave me alone. Uh, I have something in my studio. Uh, it's, it's my business, not your business. And that was kind of uh, uh, the nature of it. But these days, uh, I started to see more and more collaboration and filling the gap between different uh, 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 venues or, or genres and uh, uh, asking someone to make uh, your piece is also a, it's a, it's a collaborative uh, effort. Uh, which uh, I, I totally understand, and I'm sure there's a, there are many benefits to it, and um, uh, that's what I'm seeing. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm just kind of throw that, that image into this uh, context. But yeah, thank you. Um, we have just a couple minutes left. We're going to ask just a few more questions, and we want to leave some time at the end for um, questions for some of our attendees to be able to ask you guys some more specific targeted questions. So um, I would love to hear just a few quick words from each of you about, you know, sort of the root of this discussion being ageism in the arts. Um, if you, you know, what is your personal perspective on ageism in contemporary arts? And do you feel like con the contemporary art scene is treated as sort of like a, you know, a young, person's feel, the new hot artist fresh out of school? Do you, do you guys feel like you, there's prejudice against you as older artists? Yeah. So, um, I don't know, in a sense, yes, um, but I'm still invited to shows. So I think it's interesting because when I'm in um, a show with a lot of younger contemporary artists, my piece kind of really stands out because it's pretty much old school in comparison. But um, I found a lot of respect from the younger um, artists, at least in my community. I don't know about other communities. In my community is the Chicano, the Chicano community. And so um, I do get a lot of respect from the younger artists. And so did my husband, um, who was just a little bit older than me. And and um, they call us, uh, you know, our, the elders, you know, the, the mentors. So um, we, we, he, he gets, uh, uh, when he was alive, he got a lot, a lot of respect. And I feel the same way um, 
but you know, I don't venture too far out to other communities. And that's the way I like it. That's the way I prefer it. I mean, that's what I do. Um, I'm working with Chicano Humanities and Arts Council. So what I like to do is bring in the younger, less experienced artists so that they have the opportunity to start, start showing so that they can become the next, you know, uh, artists that are out there in the um, community. And, and um, so there's a lot of artists who are at my age group um, who venture out and they go into other communities and um, they have their art shows all the time. And uh, Manuel was uh, my, my, one of my mentors when I was young and growing up and he was like one of the first mentors for me, um, him and Carlota Espinosa. Um, so, I mean, that's what we do. We just teach our young, you know, send it to the next generation and they send it to the next generation. We pass on um, the wand, the sword, whatever that is. We just pass it on and uh, work, work in that way. Uh, I, I just like to say that I, uh, well, well, you know, I, being involved with the, the Chicano movement and doing artwork, uh, uh, you know, related to, to the, to the struggle, uh, you know, I thought it, it, you know, it pretty much had to be, uh, figurative, uh, and not abstract, uh, because you're, you know, you're, you're trying to send a social message, uh, to people, uh, instill pride in, in, the, in their culture <laughs> or the, here. Uh, so, so I found myself in the very beginning being exclusively, uh, representational or traditional, if you want to call it that, uh, because I thought, you know, it was necessary, you know, you, if you're painting, uh, a mural, uh, like the great Mexican muralists, uh, did in Mexico, who essentially, uh, did murals that everybody could understand, you know, it's a, a, a mural is like a public speech, uh, and, uh, later on, uh, there are other muralists that became more abstract, like Tabayo. Uh, but my point is, is that it depends, you know, what your purpose and the mural is, is all about, you know, what, if you're trying to relay a message, you can't be too contemporary, too abstract because no one really understands. I mean, it could be decorative, uh, type of mural or something like that, but I have found myself, uh, because because I felt very strongly of of, of, of creating images that that uh, our people could identify with, and you can't do that too abstractly uh, with non-objective art. You know, I don't think so. However, I I enjoy doing abstracts myself. I, I you know, it's kind of like my fun time when I'm not doing a commission and following. A community's criteria or something like that. Uh, that to me, so I, I don't, I'm, I'm not prejudiced against it. I, you know, I'm not uh, anti abstraction or anything like that because I find it uh, very uh, therapeutic, uh, fulfilling to throw up a canvas sometime and not have any idea of what I'm going to do. Uh, I'll pick up, you know, the first color and and throw it on there and that color will suggest another color to me or another form or whatever and just take me you know before you know it i'm the painting's pretty much dictating to me what to do it's like uh it's like the the images that are coming through me and not from me they're they're uh and i i enjoy that i i enjoy i enjoy doing that uh, I, I'm not I'm certainly not a. I'm, I'm more known and have made my living on doing more figurative work and commissions. But uh, if given the opportunity, and I have done some large abstract sculptures, uh, I, I like the one I just told, told you about, this 35 feet high in Denver. But the I I don't think I I mean I if if, if, if I I could do that commission and I would enjoy doing something like that because it's it's more uh 
you know, personal. I mean, it's it's a pers- more personal expression. But because I'm essentially a muralist, and uh, and my mission has been uh, related more to to people. I, I I've been essentially a people painter all my life. Uh, but uh, but I've also tried to educate people. Uh, you know about their history and, and things that they should be proud of. Uh, kind of following the steps of Diego Rivera, Chicados. Uh, but uh, anyway, I just thought I'd point that out. I I I, uh, I I I enjoy doing it all. Let me put it that way. And I, I you know I'm asked all the time, do you like painting more than sculpture? And and I you know it's hard to you know it's like asking me if you like one daughter more than your other daughter or whatever uh it's so uh, i enjoy doing it all and and i continue to do it as i get older i think i, I am getting more into uh, more abstraction type of work uh because it's just it's it's fun to do you know and, that, and that's what it's all about when you get old it's just try to have more fun right <laughs> right totally well Sharon Yoshi, did you have anything to say oh, yeah. about? Oh, yeah. Go have, ahead, Yoshi. I have different um, answers probably to to this particular question. Uh, uh, let's see. I'm coming from Japan. The it, it it's a country that we respect elders and those who have experienced. And um, I, the instantaneously, if someone see someone has done something for a long time, uh, it, they they think. Uh, the, the, he or she had some value, uh, something, some wisdom, and to for for people to learn from. And um, but in the United States is a different uh, country, and uh, it's it's uh, uh, the it preferences, uh, young, fresh, new energy, and we focus on that, and we give a lot of encouragement to younger generation to come up with something exciting and new and useful, and that's. That's, you know, that's so the, it, beyond any, you know, like art field, it, it, the, we have this, you know, Americans have this certain set my, mindset uh, to focus on uh, youth. And so in that, in that uh, context, I, uh, I shouldn't make any complaint uh, if I were, uh, you know, kind of uh, discriminated or, or put aside. And because uh, I have a motto that I don't, I don't worry about. I try not to worry about things I cannot control, and, um, uh, and so I just simply accept. So these days, I if you see me, whatever, I, I have no, uh, 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 yeah, I just don't. I don't. I don't care. <laughs> and uh, uh, it, 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 it's um, uh, uh, it frees me actually to a degree, and um, uh, but even I cannot control. I have a small desire. And Rhino, uh, 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 which is the stability of my studio situation, because I have moved my studio so many times in my life, and as you know, moving is a lot of work. And uh, uh, um, the, the, the seeing the Rhino's rapid change of uh, its internal and external purpose has frightened me, <laughs> to, all, quite honestly, in, in that regard. But again, that, this is something I cannot control. So I have to go with flow, as um, uh, uh, Brian Eno uh, once said. He uh, we control things, but also we let go. Uh, we we just kind of uh, 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 go with flow, and and that's uh, that's my attitude now. Awesome. I just want to recall the golden times in Rhino for me was. Well, several times. One was when we were brand new, when we just did this thing uh, 30 years ago, we were hot stuff in the news. We had newspaper articles and, you know, the post would be out here in the Rocky Mountain News. Oh, how well, oh, how wonderful pattern for life, all that kind of stuff. That was, that was sweet when we were trying to build interest in art in this neighborhood uh, we were trying to say yeah look at the art artists who live at silver square where i live etc 
Then the next sweet time was when uh, we had three art galleries one block away. So the synergy between the four of us was fantastic. We would have openings together, et cetera. So there was a, a lot of synergy, a lot of all kinds of people, young and old. Uh, I find that now, and I used to have regularly have shows of three and 400 people uh, coming. And since they have all gone, and we, I am now in the heart of high rise rhino with a 12 story thing going up next door. I, I mean, you can't count the cranes in my neighborhood. Uh, and you know, maybe someday the people who eventually live in these high rises might actually come over. But um, I'm feeling now after 30 years like old news. I'm not, I'm not feeling like new news. Tanner Shop's been here forever. I'm not feeling the same kind of uh, interest in the community to this experience of a live work environment, et cetera. So as Yoshi says, you can't do anything about it. Everybody's always looking for a hot new thing. It, you know, that's that's just- But you know, but you know Sharon, you know, I, I remember I and the fabulous days uh, with uh, socialization. And, and we want to remember the fact that all kinds of restrictions uh, forced to us by the pandemic, uh, and uh, you know, absolutely, I went have, through have imp imp delays. implanted some hesitancy of, for social interactions among us. And um, uh, I personally am making an effort to revive my old habit of just seeing and chatting with people, and mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, grad gradually accepting this uh, this invitation, an invitation to this Zoom talk. Is one of the efforts, uh, efforts I, I believe. So I totally appreciate that uh, uh, I became part of it. But we, we also have to be, uh, uh, be become uh, a little more aware of the the recent habit is you know kind of confining us, and we need to get out because seeing other people is just, it's so inspirational. Well, part of my problem with getting out is I can't <laughs> walk. So. Well. You know, well, but, uh, you, know you, have you know, I finally got a walker, you know, that I have to put you know, anyway. It's just, it's a pain in the neck. It's a pain in the neck I to know. not have the same capacity to do things that I did before. You know, that's aging. So let's, do more, let's aging. do more Zoom talk. Well, yep. I'm with an organization that seems to be hot right now <laughs> because I have so many interviews um, about, uh, you know, different shows that Chalk is doing. And we are all over the city. And since COVID happened and we had to give up the lease to our building, um, there have been so many other organizations who now finally want to connect with the Chicano, Hispanic, Latino, Black community. And so they are inviting us to go to their location. So I'm pretty, or we, we as a collective are pretty lucky in that way that now we are, you know, what people need, what people want. They want our voice, you know, to know more about who we are as um, people of color. So um, I feel like in a sense, we are more relevant than we were when we first started. And that was like many years of struggle to get to that point. I mean, within our community, we know and love each other and treat ourselves as family. But as far as a larger community, we are now more hot. <laughs> So yeah, that's pretty I, 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 I would agree with that part of that, you know, because I've been dealing with uh, actually there's a real people don't realize it, but there's a lot of systemic realism in the, I mean, of racism in the arts. And I, uh, and I, and I was since 1985, uh, after griping to the uh, arts community about uh, like the Colorado Council on the Arts and Humanities. Uh, never had a, a person of color on their board. And so I was one of the first ones, uh, because I griped about it, to be on the board. Uh, and and uh, if you look at, if you look at all the, the, the past commissions that have been um, 
commission in this state and in this city, the, the vast majority, and I can't tell you exactly, but I bet it's at least 90 percent, have all been white artists. And almost a lot of them have been outside of the Colorado area. And and, uh, and and being on the other side of the table as a as a board member of the Colorado Council on the Arts, uh, I I seen it was a big frustration for me. Uh, you know, being a per- the only person of color on there because uh, there I you, you know when you have eleven other people that just vote that are all white. Uh, voting on things and, and i've sat on a lot of committees over the years for public works of art which are all essentially white again uh the you know that's just a, the reality that we as people of color have had to deal with uh for for you know since the beginning since i since i've been in the arts and then as far as i know i mean we 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 founded the Museo de las Americas because of the Denver Art Museum not interested in doing any Latino shows, mm-hmm. and you know well, it, it was the frustration. And to fight, finally we got you know so, uh, you know here they're doing Malinche now and uh, I'm in Colorado. that one. <laughs> yeah, we have our Rada Center. We have the right. Botanic you, Gardens. You're absolutely right. Really uh, that, but, you know, we, we have to realize, and it's still going on. It's not over. There's still a lot of systemic racism in the arts in this town. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, you know, and I could, I could. Bear not only that. in the arts. Yeah, it's. Every, she said, "Not only in the arts." Education, <laughs> it's a business. You name it, it's it's there. And that's mm-hmm. one of the things I'm finally people are starting to realize our value, and and are wanting to to include us. Uh, but you know, we in the past have never been considered Chicano artists that are finally getting legitimized as artists. They never really took us seriously as artists. And uh, now, you know, the Smithsonian and a lot of other major museums throughout uh, the the country. Are, are finally, uh, you know, come, uh, you know, ha- having exhibitions and all that, that can be more inclusive of people of color. And I'm, I'm so, I'm really glad that I could see that before, before I, before I pass on. You know, I, I didn't think I'd ever see it, but it's happening. And it took a lot of work for us to get there, didn't it, Manuel? A lot of work. <laughs> you, can, you can provide a lot of insight to that. We're still, we're still working on it. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I don't, I don't know if I like to use the, the this word called systemic racism, um, because I, I've observed it's, it's kind of natural consequences of the the, the history in, in any any countries that has some some favorism uh, uh, being developed, and um, and I was in the Bay Area, and the Bay Area has huge sort of diverse communities, as you probably know, and no comparison with Denver or Colorado. And, um, uh, and, and I remember, uh, let me see, 40 years ago, 35 years ago, and like Asian community was complaining to uh, a University of California system that why our kids having incredible uh, 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 grades in high school uh, or, or in, in college, not getting into, uh, 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 you know, UC Berkeley or, 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 or graduate school in UC, you know, UC system. And um, then it's true, it was uh, like that. And, 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 and so people started to uh, really take a look at the details. And um, uh, oh, yes, maybe many uh, uh, Caucasian was, were in, in school, but it's not, not quite like racism was uh, uh, behind, the, behind the post, but it's like, you know, when you when you read it, uh, 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 what is it? Uh, some kind of literature that student brings to application, and uh, if if they talk about say the uh, experience in uh, 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 YMCA camp or something, and that was very useful for him to or how to develop their characters, and um, the. The, the readers, the, the p- people who are reading those uh, essays, uh, if they, they if they have say quotation, they they can relate to it, and far more you know easy to 
kind of communicate. Meanwhile, if you know, like Vietnamese girl were talking about both, you know, the story of both people, and they they don't know how to react to it. So the the that that kind of sort of kind of natural sort of. Uh, uh, the preference of favorism uh, was happening, uh, even they are, they are not aware of the racism or something. So they started to notice, okay, we have to put, put the uh, uh, diverse people for the, for the, uh, the, the other end, like, you know, the jewelers and, and selectors or so on and so forth. And um, like you were, you know, Emmanuel, you were talking about, you know, there, there weren't many, uh, uh, di you know, uh, People in color in in the committees or so on and so forth, and that's true. But the I don't know if that's systemic, but it's just kind of natural concept it's because the population, you know, Colorado, its majority is it's Caucasian and uh, uh, traditionally, or and that kind of started to form uh, uh, different organizations, different system, or so on and so forth. And but we are the one probably has to. Uh, pay attention to it and let them notice, you know, maybe it's a good idea to provide uh, you know, diverse eyes to everywhere, anywhere. And uh, so we can get maybe fair results out of it. And that's probably what the politicians and the many activists are doing. Um, and I don't know. I think this is a really interesting topic and I would love to go on forever about all this because it's just so compelling and we're so honored to have you all here, but I know that we're about five minutes out from closing and I wanted to give an opportunity to the people that um, are listening in to be able to ask you all any specific questions before we kind of wrap up with what each and every one of you all are currently working on. So is there anybody that's listening that has any questions for any of these panelists today? Yep. Go ahead, Morgan, if you wanna let me Yeah, and um, thank you all. This has been fascinating and thank you all for your, for your work. Um, my question is, have you found that the content of your work, maybe the style has shifted as your perspective on life has shifted? You know, we talk about elders having wisdom. I'm not sure, you know, if that happens or not, um, but it seems like it has for you all. And I just, just wondered, um, have you noticed a shift? Uh, as I, it, in my in my case, uh, uh, you know, it has it has it, it has shifted uh, uh, to make you know I I have uh, tried to do artwork that is uh, more inclusive, uh, more universal in relation to all people, uh, as opposed to Chicanismo. Uh, but the the but my you know I I still I I still lean towards the, the indigenous uh, inspiration or spirit you might say uh, and, and I, I'm finding myself going more in that direction uh, and and uh, but you know even, even at that I mean. Yeah, I, I we I, I think we just w would like respect as uh, as the artist and not who did it. I mean, when when people go to the Sistine Chapel, uh, they don't think even even though the wall, the ceilings are all white, they're all, all the persons up there are white. They they I, I don't think most people even think of that. They 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 see it as a great piece of artwork, but. I mean, the bottom line though is that Michelangelo always remained Italian, and uh, and that's what you know the, the kind of work he did, uh, and you know, and you know that goes for you know some of the other great artists. Uh, you know, they they've uh, you know expanded and all that and in, in their career, like Picasso, that. You know, just obviously then so many different types of art, but the uh, but you know people people you know do we we do have some of value that I think should be appreciated by people and celebrated, uh, and, uh, and and we're you know people are just taking now a second look at what we've been doing for a long time, but we'll, but we 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 do like everybody every other artist we you know we 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 grow or we like to think we grow and change uh and uh and and i and, and it's you know i think it's all for the good of humanity and, and 
as we get older, we, we, uh, it, it, you know, we, we, we realize you know, that it's, it's necessary to, to be more inclusive and, uh, uh, you know, and respectful of other arts, right? But go ahead. I don't want to take too much of their time. But. Do I have time to say anything? Um, I just want to say that, yeah, of course, we've all shifted our uh, perspectives on life because that's what happens when you get older. But I think kind of what's happened um, is that we have shifted other people's view of who we are. And I think that is pretty important, you know, because I don't know what they thought, you know, Chicano artists were all about or Hispanic artists, or maybe we were all radical or whatever, but, you know, now they realize that, you know, we have a vast amount of perspectives and styles and uh, way of expressing ourselves. And we're like psh, human, just like everybody else. We might be a little bit more colorful maybe, or, you know, um, whatever, but, uh, I think people see us, you know, for, for who we really are and not their pre-ordained um, idea. And I think we shifted the culture in Colorado and, you know, maybe especially in Denver because we introduced um, things like uh, events like um, Cinco de Mayo, which everybody celebrates now, Dia de los Muertos, which all the school kids know about now. And so I think we were pretty influential um, in the overall culture of uh, Colorado. Um, and we had to go out into the schools to educate. And that's what we did when we were, you know, just letting people know, letting people know, letting people know all about our culture until it kind of seeped into everything. Um, so yeah, we, 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 as we get older, we change our perspectives, but I, I am most proud that we have changed the perspective of the Chicano community. I think that's beautiful. And, um, and you know, the, the cultural identity uh, is a very important thing like that. Uh, but I'm, I'm um, uh, uh, personally, I'm more interested in individualism and, and the individual freedom, uh, which artists can exercise the, the more than other probably uh, uh, people in other field, and uh, the biggest shift I I experienced I experienced in my life is I became a, a full time artist uh, when I moved to Colorado uh, uh, sixteen years ago, and it was a risky one, but uh, it paid off to me. And um, uh, uh, but I, I still hesitate to recommend and and my way to others, uh, but sometimes you may uh, want to take a risk for better and uh, unexpected result. Um, and, 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 and in one, in one point, I, I made a change, yes, but not in terms of going with new trend in art world or, or a changes happening in the society, but in terms of meeting the goal in my life. And uh, I, I tried to, to uh, uh, put myself in alignment to that idea. And uh, the you know, continuous curiosity and to uh, things outside of myself that I describe as an awareness of others. And um, here others not only imply for people, but also other things, say bronze for one example, say things in natural world uh, like trees. And uh, yes, trees exist outside of my physical uh, body, you know, physically, uh, but as well as, uh, you know, conceptual agitations for, uh, for art. So such independent thinking uh, of mine, I may feed who I am as an artist, I think. Sharon, you wanna wrap it up? Well, I, I'd wrap it up simply. I'm going, I'm, I'm scaling up. I'm making bigger work. Good for you. Yay. Big. <laughs> big work, just like Matisse on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, thank you all so much for being a part of this conversation today. It was truly an honor to talk to every single one of you. Um, I don't know if there's anything specific that you all are working on or that you want anybody to pay attention to, um, to any current projects, but I don't know if you want to talk about it now or give a quick plug before we just wrap up. Yeah, so Chicano Humanities and Arts Council um, has shows coming up 
Uh, there's um, one happening in North Glen. Uh, we're taking down a show, putting up a photography show at um, Pierce, wait, what's it called? Parsons um, uh, Theater in uh, North Glen. We have another show going up in Brighton um, and that's a Santos show. Check out our website, www.chalkgallery.web. I have a show, uh, Mala Nolly on the Rocks. I have um, a piece in there. Um, my husband um, has, he, he, we're taking down the show um, in North Glen that he just had, or he, it's still there. Um, but we're putting up a, uh, the, the show that we have for him, Stephen Lucero. Um, opens in um, Meow Wolf, next to the room that he did. And that um, is kind of officially opened as of two days ago, but um, his opening is on the 25th of March. We have a heart show coming up. Um, so check out the website and we have a whole lot of shows all over the place. We just got a new home. Um, 40 West, and so we are really cooking. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I already pointed out that uh, that I've been in, in, a, in a show uh, in the Denver Art Museum, Marlene Chin. I would urge you all to go see that. Uh, you know, it's a it's a it's a significant uh, part of our you know our history. Uh, with uh, this show and uh, and we there, then the other one I would just say is the one in Boulder, uh, uh, Viva Bosses, which has to do with also our Chicano history in the, in uh, in the Colorado uh, that they're putting on, and that's going to be up for about a year. Or so it'll be around at the Boulder Museum if you if you're in that area and. And that's about it, other than the show I'm having in, in, uh, or with in uh, Fort Worth, Texas right now. That's great. Sharon, Yoshi, you got any upcoming stuff? I think I said too much. Not a thing. I'm still in COVID malaise. <laughs> well, I enjoyed it. Thank you for inviting uh, yeah. us to this. Uh, and I saw your piece, Manuel. It's really cool. <laughs> what piece? Oh yeah. Yeah, the, uh, uh, yeah, at the uh, uh, art museum. Yeah, very cool, cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you all so much. Nineteen eighty. Old piece. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you all. Um, really appreciate it. And Ali, did you want to just uh, say some few words to wrap everything up real quick? Yeah. Uh, thank you all so much, our panelists. That was such great insight. And thank you to our moderators, Alex and Ari. That was just a great conversation. Um, we will be sending the recording out to all attendees after the panel's over. Um, we have another workshop coming up in April about greening your practice that will also be virtual. Um, that'll be on April 28th. So look out for more information on that. And then in May, we're going back live in person. Um, we're going to do a branding and website development uh, workshop with Art Boss on May 24th. So stay tuned and thank you all again. Um, and we'll see everyone soon. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Is, okay, I have a question. Is it a temporary link or um, is this permanent or how does that work? It will go on YouTube. Yes, CBCA will post it to their YouTube as well as Transforming Creatives YouTube as well. So, okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.